So I have to give you the some where, where we are going in the experimental high energy physics areas. And unfortunately, I do not have much freedom like my predecessors. I do not have any personal prejudices because experimental high energy physics field is basically defined by roadmaps, by project, Microsoft project, by timeline and so on. So I have to exactly follow those, no deviation. That's what I'm going to talk about it. But it is really a great time to be in, a, in, the, in the particle physics community, to be part of that. We have this beautiful standard model of particle physics, and uh, that's what we are celebrating today. But it has not happened just in one day. It's really a long journey of something. Where do I start? In 1896, we start that, in the discovery of the electron, the first elementary particle. So it is almost 120 years of uh, history, and uh, that is uh, with us. So before I start talking about the future, it may be appropriate to talk a little bit about our past and uh, how we have reached to the stage where we are today. And in this whole journey, the great enabler for us is the development of the tools of various kinds. That has given us all the opportunities to explore these all frontiers that we are doing today. So let's go back to that one, and I will, in the next few transparencies, let's celebrate that uh, journey uh, of 120 years or so in our field. So that is to start evolution. There are many evolutions that took place in these 120 years. So talk about the evolution of our tool for discovery in terms of detectors. Look at the detectors that was used to detect the first elementary particles, that is the electron by J.J. Thomson in 1896. And this is just, you know, cathode discharge tube. And from there, he just, uh, using some magnetic field and so on, he concluded that electrons are much lighter than the uh, much lighter than the atom and so on. So that started with a simple experiment. And the latest one in that is this huge humongous detector, Atlas detector, that was one of the two detectors that discovered the Higgs boson and uh, completed the standard model. Of course, this is not just come from that to that. That is a complete path of evolution. And in that process, there are many discoveries and many inventions. And the Rutherford, he used just a cathode, um, uh, actually basically a, a source and, the, and a gold foil and a screen in front to find out the structure of the atoms, the nucleus. From then, we had the cloud chamber discovered by Wilson, the bubble chamber, and then the multi proportional chamber which is basically the starting of the modern detectors. By the way, all these detectors that you are seeing here, they got Nobel Prizes for not doing any physics, but just for inventing the tools that they have given us. So that is actually the evolution on detectors. We also have other areas in accelerators. We started our field with the nature given us the accelerator, that is the cosmic rays that we you know, all our discoveries, many, many of the, in the particle physics in the early days, in the early part of the last centuries, are the gift of cosmic rays. That's what has given us all the particles. However, we move, soon realize that we have to go further, need, uh, you know, high intensity, high energy, in a controlled way, and then the convention came in the forms of Lorentz accelerator, and uh, this is the cyclotron he was, it was holding his, not he, but somebody is in the museum holding, and, uh, but this is the first attempt for building an accelerator. And from there today, we have this humongous machine, the LHC, which is doing all this one. Of course, in between a long journey of that one. It is actually, I would say, the evolution of accelerators. Then look up the data collection. How do we collect data? In the old days, we just needed a camera. Basically, sometimes a stereo camera to take the pictures. And that's how we took all the pictures in cloud chamber days, in the bubble chamber days. That's bubble chamber days, they are just photographs. That's it. No trigger, effectively nothing. Just analyze that and then get your particles, new particles discovered. Today, we have this, 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 this our, our search of particle has become very, very complex. And stealing these uh, slides from Sudeshna's talk on the first day, and this is the, what CMS is looking at that one single event. 
thousands of particles, many interaction points, and so on. And how do we get this picture? It's very complicated data acquisition system. If you look into the data acquisition system that CDF use, is actually CMS use, is start with a 40 megahertz collision, okay? Every 25 nanosecond collision is taking place, and in each collision, there are many interactions is happening. And, and from there, this 40 megahertz, we can only put into tape to 100 hertz. So there is a very sophisticated triggering system, filtering the event online. First stage, it is the hardware. Everything is hardware, looking quickly at the data, then go to that one and look more details in a complex computer system where complete data is almost analyzed online and only pick up the events of your interest. Of course, in the process, maybe we may be losing something, we don't know. So, but that is how it is today. This evolution has taken place. Now, it is also that how we ourselves have evolved. In the old days, when J.J. Thompson, he was alone, did his experiment, okay, and discovered the electron. Soon later, Rutherford, he had some companion, Geiger is one of them, and then his student, not so big a group. Well, this evolved, and then look at Leon Lederman, when he discovered the upsilon, or the bottom quark, he has a dozen of collaborators with him. Today, what we have is this, 4,000 physicists, not only physicists, engineers, electronics experts, software gurus, you name it, they are in that collaboration. And you need all of them to discover today's particle. So this is where we are there. there it's, a, oh, it's an individual to global enterprise. We have gone everywhere. Wherever it's possible, we are ready to go there to find the secrets of nature. So from the space, this is the AMS experiment in the space, to deep underground, doing experiments for, the, for unraveling the secrets of the nature. So this is our journey. Now, how we have approached, we have, we have exploited all the frontiers available to us. And I will be talking about those frontiers a bit later. So we have the energy frontiers, where we have bigger and bigger machine, higher and higher energy accelerators colliding, producing new particles. But we have also, same time, it is also may not be needed this energy, but you can go increase the intensity. And through quantum loops, you can look at a physics of much higher scale. And that is another way to go. And finally, we have the cosmic frontier, which is always with us. So we have explored all the three frontiers in our field. Now, with this, all these different frontiers and so on, what we have built? We have built this beautiful picture. The beautiful picture of what everything is made out of. What is the basic constituents of matter? We have the quarks, lepton, few of them, beautifully, all the force carrying forces, and the Higgs bosons. And we have seen all of them in our experiments today. And that's why we are celebrating the standard model is complete. It is not only that, it is looking inside, it is going inward, but also looking outward with our friends. And we have a now a bigger picture of the whole cosmos, how it was started, a very minute picture of the whole cosmos. And together, these two information, we have built how the universe was created, how it has evolved, where we are today. This is a tremendous achievement of our field, I would say. And, but we must also remember that we are, all this achievement is only connected to this 5% of the visible matter. We have this huge part, we have to still explore the 25% of the dark matter and the 70% of the dark energy and so on. And that's probably, I'm going to tell you that where the experimentalists are trying to do in the near future. But while doing all our science, we need, we need the, you know, the blessings of the governments. We need taxpayers' money. And in a, over, over the years, this, this our demand is increasing. The amount of money we need is just enormous. It is true. So we have to also answer what we are doing, giving back to the society. It is very important to keep us in mind that we have to always address that one. So benefits of particle physics research for society. I'll start with a quote. Actually, this is a, this is a real thing. When Bob Wilson was, uh, was uh, presenting the, 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 uh, the, the Fermi Lab uh, project, to the committee of the congressman, he was asked a question that, okay, Mr. Wilson, you are going to build this accelerator, but what it is going to do for the defense of the country? 
Of course, what Bob Wilson answered, it looks actually, you know, not so good actually, not so nice. He said, they are nothing, but it will make it worth defending, that is your country. But that's not really, probably Bob was really too irritated from such answers, because it was Bob Wilson who is known as the father of proton therapy, because he's the first who in 1946 wrote this paper where he pointed out the benefits of accelerated particle beam for the cancer therapy and so on. So this is actually, he is, that's why he's known as the father of the proton therapy. It is not only that, within 10 years of the establishment of the Fermilab, by the way, Fermilab is just now celebrating his 50th anniversary, and actually it is, it is they, 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 they treated the first patient in 1976 in the Fermilab neutron. In another 10 years, it built, it helped, it built the first proton accelerator at Loma Linda University in the California Medical Center. It is the first hospital-based proton therapy center, okay, for the treatment of cancer. And today, we have 58 such proton therapy centers around the world, and 52 another is under construction, including two in India. One in Chennai at the Apple Hospital, another was in the Tata Memorial Center at Bombay. Well, so that is the one thing that we have done, but we have actually, list is quite much bigger than that. We have seen that there are, at the moment, roughly 20,000 accelerators in the world are being used for not for doing particle physics work, but for other societal applications. And this is our, we can see that the list is increasing, and, 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 and this is the synchrotron radiation sources that is used by all the material scientists and the biologists today. Well, if you look into the division, this is roughly the division today where the accelerators are being used for other purposes. But this is not only thing that we are doing. Actually, the accelerator is to be used, and, and, and that is actually probably going to solve our energy problem in the future in a safe way in what you call is, is subcritical reactors where thorium can be converted to make the energy and the benefits of an accelerator connected to that one. Okay, so this is pouring this pellation neutron, which those neutrons will be converting the thorium into uranium-233, and this is a big program, even in our country, in a big way, for using this technology, using the accelerator-based system. And that has helped even the, our country to participate in a collaboration with Fermilab, for example, for, for generating this kind of technology. So this is, you know, it is a both a win-win situation for, for both sides. So this is, uh, probably another area that you can talk about, and there are many, many applications uh, of, 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 of the technologies that is developed by, by our, our field. And of course, finally, you all remember that right now, you are not listening to my talk, but looking at the web. Uh, I know that one. And you must also thank that to the particle physics community, because this is the note that is written by, by Bernard, Tim Bernard Lee in 1989 to the CERN management, that he needed some money to sub to generate this, uh, you know, share the, share the data all over the world. And what came next is WWW. That's all clear. And then, of course, the later on, during the era of the, of the LHC, the grid computing is also being developed and this uh, helped in developing uh, grid technology by both the CMS Atlas and Alice collaboration. So with this among us uh, use of the technology, it must be not inappropriate to make this statement. The quest for fundamental knowledge, as embodied by particle physics, is the hallmark of a civilized nation. Difficult questions in basic science require innovative technical solutions, and a wide range of science disciplines have benefited from the technological advances generated by studies in particle physics. Well, this is not a statement made by any particle physicist, but this statement is by Sir Paul Nurse, who is the Nobel laureate in medicine in 2001. So he made that statement. So it must be true. So we must all celebrate this, you know, this tremendous achievement that our field, not only in the field of particle physics, but in generating technology. And we must keep in mind this part of aspect. Whenever you go and talk to your taxpayer or talk to the politician for funds, this is the point we have to emphasize all the time why we are doing science. Well, let's come back to particle physics. And I am just telling this transparency uh, from the IHF 2060. This is 
ANCP is the final slide, and where he pointed out all the outstanding questions of particle physics today. So we have solved, we have almost standard model is complete. But if you look at the question that remains, it's just enormous, okay? So if all these questions there, I'll come back to that, some of them, but I'm not going to read all of them to you, but all these questions there, at least for the young people in the back, this is really a fantastic time to be in particle physics because you all have to solve these questions. Well, to solve these questions, we can give you some, 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 some tools to play, and I am going to talk about some of those tools that is under consideration uh, by the community. And uh, this is, let me talk about uh, the energy frontiers. First, what is happening there? Of course, the spectacular success of LSC, okay, in the energy frontier. We all know that, we are all celebrating that today. And we have this, you know, this, this, um, this, uh, this luminosity that has delivered is something like 58 femtobar inverse, uh, in 2016 already, and it's still running and collecting data. By the end of this run two, we'll have, of course, uh, uh, we'll be reaching almost 100 uh, inverse femtoburn of data for each of these experiments. And this experiment has helped us to study all this coupling to Higgs for different particles. And uh, that has helped us to find out their coupling constants and looks like they're within matched uh, standard model very nicely. And beyond that, we have also connected that, uh, that transparency that we have seen in the last few days, quite a few times, is that we have seen that uh, it looks, it, this particle that we have seen is looks like a, a top um, um, Higgs or smells like a Higgs, uh, Higgs or it should be a Higgs particle because it's mass, uh, you know, linearly proportional, coupling is linearly proportional to the mass and so on. However, so with this, then why you want to go and look for new machine? So what is LSC and beyond? So, so far, the picture is that Higgs behave like a standard model particle within a large answer uncertainty. You have seen in my earlier transparency the large uncertainties, and even in the previous talk, my colleague has pointed out even the uncertainties that uh, he's ready to, you know, manage within, but we are not. We are not happy. Unfortunately, LHC will continue to provide a fuzzy picture of Higgs. We don't get a very clear picture. That's clear, even with the high luminosity LHC. So what will the question that will remain to be answered? These are, is it a truly elementary Higgs? Is it a composite? Self-interaction of Higgs, one of the major questions, that is probably the important question, because this is the only where Higgs can show that one. What is the shape of the electroweak symmetry breaking potential and how it is restored at high scale? We only looking at the Higgs at the moment is the vacuum, the quadratic oscillation around the vacuum, but uh, is that, uh, what is the full shape of the potential? That's uh, John Ellis was pointing out again and again in his talks earlier. Is there more than one fundamental Higgs field? Is the Higgs, is it a Higgs or the Higgs? That question, the Higgs decay in other invisible and exotic mode. Maybe you will be having some hints there of new physics, maybe supersymmetry or something else. All these questions, to answer these questions, LHC is not enough. A program focused on Higgs coupling to fermions and vector bosons to a precision of few percent or less is required to answer this question, okay? So this is the somewhere, for example, if you look at the, what the ATLAS and CMS is going to achieve, even with the high luminosity, 3,000 femtobar inverse of data, that is supposed to be by the end of this high luminosity run, is roughly at the level maximum of 5% precision or so. But we need better than that. We need better than that, so we need, uh, so we need to put kids under a more powerful microscope to test the, really this, these things. And for example, here, we are, we, we currently we are just looking into the, you know, just here, what is the Higgs potential is look like, but if you look into the full shape, we have to go study the self-coupling very accurately, and for that, how, look at what is uh, LHC is giving us. At the moment, we don't have actually, this is the only measurement of the Higgs self-coupling, and uh, most important one is BB Tau Tau, that uh, Satoki on day one uh, uh, was um, telling us, and this is really even now something like 28 or 25 times higher than the standard model you know, expectation, so much higher. So let's see what it will, what will, what will know by the time the high luminosity LHC come. Even in the best scenario for BB tau tau we, or BB gamma gamma, we'll have 1.6 sigma, okay? And this is the level we'll be going at that time. This is not enough to answer the question and even to establish the self-coupling of Higgs, and we need to go to new machine. 
and some, for example, friction accelerator, whether Higgs is composite or self-coupling of Higgs, you have to go to a future accelerator. So where are those future? And of course, there are this SUSY, and uh, there is still no evidence of SUSY, but uh, you have only gone up to 2 TeV. Maybe we have to explore the whole you know, scenario. You have to go much higher. So, but fortunately for us, for the last 50 years or so, we had a roadmap. Okay, we had the standard model of particle physics in 1966 or so, which are defined the you know the the roadmap for us to go in the direction, and we have exactly followed that roadmap, but only narrowed down the you know the area errors and things on, and we have we have particle physics beyond LC, so we have just followed that roadmap, not much problem there, but now we don't have a roadmap because standard model is already there. So we have to go beyond that. So that's what we are saying. Particle physics after LSC is just we are in a high seat. You don't know the direct, which direction to go, but you have to find your way. And in this era, which is going to happen, we are entering the data-driven physics era. But this is not new for us. Till 1960s, we were in such field. The data were guiding the theories. And that was the heyday for the theories probably to play with the data and give us new directions. Okay. So I think the theorists should be also very happy. I know all of you are here theorists, not a single experimentalist except one there. And uh, so it is actually, uh, it will be a good time for all the theorists to go to the data-driven physics era, because you will have all the way. So who are the players there? Of course, the International Linear Collider is the most advanced one in terms of planning, thinking, and even the engineering details has been worked out for this experiment, for this collider. What is the plan is to have uh, this, this heart of this one is this 1.3 gigahertz superconducting radio frequency cavities, which can hold up to 31.5 MeV per meter. Actually, actually, they have established much higher than that, roughly around 37 MeV or so, but what they need is 31.5 MeV or so. It is established that it is possible to build that machine and uh, so on. This is one of them of this kind. And uh, it is a linear collider, as you can see, where it will be colliding here, and then there will be a possibility of two detectors and uh, one of the other. And then when they have gone into details of uh, this detector design, what it will be, it's actually based on today's technology. You know, this is all, all, all today's technology. For example, one of the two detectors, silicon detector is at a silicon tracker, and then silicon tungsten uh, uh, based uh, uh, electromagnetic calorimeter and then uh, RPC-based hadron calorimeter, and uh, so on. So this is usual technology, but higher granularity. So how this will be done? So here, the ILC physics is basically, the Higgs production will be mainly through these three diagrams here, the plot. Here, uh, this is the uh, this Higgs trallum, where E plus E minus going to Z Higgs, and uh, this is the main contributor here, but it will be added by the WW fusion and ZZ fusion at uh, higher energies and so on. So this is, this is the way to uh, go for that one. The advantage of this one is tremendous actually, okay? Because you have a Z here, so by the recoil of that, uh, you know, Z, uh, Z, you will be, without looking into the Higgs, you will be able to study the properties of the Higgs, including invisible Higgs. So that is the main advantage here. And if you look into this one, now you can see that you will be able to measure the coupling constant to much better accuracy than what the high luminosity LHC will give us. So this is really a tremendous advance there. Of course, for example, looking into the coupling constant itself, you can differentiate various models of your favorite model. For example, here, Higgs compositeness will reduce the, all the coupling constants of all the channels. And for example, in case of SUSI, some of the channels is getting enhanced, some are not, and so on. So there are, you can play with this coupling constant, measuring the coupling constant to that accuracy with very new physics at all. Well, ILC is the not only uh, the machine that uh, people are thinking of, there is the proposal for the future circular collider study that is at CERN. This is the continuous process, the way CERN developed. They will have a project now, ILC is running, and um, uh, this, sorry, LHC is running, and the end of high luminosity LHC, what the CERN will be doing. This, this, this roadmap has been defined, and they are working around something around a 100 TV PP machine in a 100 kilometer, but it is not just a PP machine. It will work as the E plus E minus collider. It will also work as the EP machine at the type of HERA, 
and, and, and at the beginning, they will be using, this is a 100 kilometer tunnel, but to begin with, they will use the CERN tunnel, current tunnel itself, and put high, uh, um, uh, high field magnets there, and so this is called the high energy LHC. So this is just to test, uh, in principle, the, the capabilities of the magnets that they needed for this, uh, for this collider. Okay, so that, okay, what will be the motivation of this one? Of course, I mean, look at this uh, capabilities of this machine. For example, a heavy resonance in the strong resonance, let's say Q star, it will go up to 50 TeV, Z prime, 30 TeV, and Gluino and stop at a much higher level than the currently achievable by, by LSC. And of course, it is a precision machine at the same time, it will measure the Higgs self-coupling every few percent to a percent level. And uh, for example, if the precision for top require a decay, and it will measure the standard model parameters to very high precision and exploit the complementarity of the E plus E minus because it will, same place you will have E plus E minus and PP machines there. Well, what are the parameters of the lepton collider there? This is the, e, the uh, when they will be running this future collider in the e, e, e plus E minus mode, roughly they will be sitting on this, scan all this, uh, uh, you know, in the energy space from starting from Z, going to TT bar uh, production threshold and uh, of various kind and with the luminosity uh, that is listed here, and you can compare that with the left to luminosity of the various kind and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So this is, this is the first uh, machine that uh, they are going to build there. Then Hadron Collider here, the main thing compared to the high luminosity LHC and compared to that one. So in this to here, they are only replacing this current magnet by this high field magnet, okay? That's what is there. So use the same, uh, same tunnel and put these uh, things there and uh, rest remaining uh, up the same, but then you make it a 100 kilometer tunnel and uh, put them, and there'll be two options. Either you use it, the, the, bunch, uh, the bunch spacing uh, to something like 25 nanosecond or five nanosecond, because if you go to 25 to five nanosecond, you can put less number of proton in each bunches, so that will reduce the number of uh, you know, multiple uh, collision in the same uh, branch crossing, and there is some advantage of so. And so this is the machine that is planned there. Well, so, so even there, they have, I mean, we have to plan. So you have to plan there. You have to think about what kind of detector you need. And what is first define a detector, you first define what is the characteristics of the detector you need. Of course, it has to be much better. It has to have very good tracking. And uh, roughly, this is the tracking achievement is, uh, is the momentum measurement of 10 to 20% at 10 TV. That is the target. And then uh, this is, uh, uh, and, and then calorimeter constant term, extremely low, and so on. And it has to be highly granular, because now you can see, compared to the low PT, or even the top decay, to a B and, a, and, 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 and B and the top, and then this, sorry, the W is decaying into jets, and is the B, the separation between them is extremely small. So, so that means your granularity has to be improved a lot. So you have to have much more, you know, uh, granular detector, and they have started with the reference detector already, and have gone ahead and did the, the this is not a real GN4 based calculation, but a, what you call a Monte Carlo, uh, which is uh, having taken care of the full detector simulation into account, and roughly they have shown that this detector that they are uh, started as a baseline will do the performance that they needed uh, with a 5% uh, tracking, a muon resolution at, uh, sorry, the tracking resolution of 20% at 10 TeV, and you can, it is, of course, you know, once you go to that high energy, the physics will extend to the higher rapidity compared to at CMS at, uh, at uh, LHC. So uh, here you can see the extension of that one, how, how, how much rapidity coverage compared to CMS, is much higher, and uh, of course it has a much, this thing, the, they have calculated the electromagnetic resolution and the tracking resolution of the muon, and quite satisfying that it will do the job, now, as I started with my talk that I don't have much, we all governed by, by roadmaps and timescales and so on. So I must tell you what is the timescale they're thinking of. So they're linked, connected with their lab, uh, the CERN program. So it is, this is actually high luminosity LHC option. Uh, this is how it will, it will operate till, supposed to operate in 2035. So they must have a machine ready so that it start taking physics once this LHC high luminosity option stops. So that started around roughly around 2035. However, you put back here, so they are already in this stage already working, and they have to produce their CDR by the end of 20, 
18 because that is when the next update of the European strategy uh, program the meeting takes place and they must put this into the table for discussion and for, for the blessings of the Sound Council. Go ahead. So this is all. So meanwhile, somewhere else in China, they are also thinking of the same direction. They want to build a, a, a circular machine and, uh, and uh, this is uh, to begin with a circular electron positron collider followed by a super proton proton collider. They are similar in nature of the of the FCC proposal at CERN. So I'm not talking about uh, much about that one. Roughly the time scale is that. They want to start data taking around uh, the EP machine. They want to start data taking around 2030. And of course, they are not much discussing yet the SPPC collider option, the proton-proton option, but uh, they have roughly some roadmap they have defined for themselves. And there is enthusiastic support. This is the topmost priority of the, of the Chinese uh, particle physics community at this moment. And uh, they have also their design. The only difference is that they now want to, this machine, they want to redistribute the RF in different places. Usually in the circular machine, we put the radio frequency cavity in one place, but they want to distribute all around. There are something like six points where they want to distribute for the RF. I am not an expert to know the difference why they want to do that, but that's the main difference. Roughly the luminosity you can see is at the order of uh, 10 to the power 34, that is the, that is mostly the all machines are doing. And one additional, I'm just going the, for example, at the electric observable, how measured, how accurately they'll measure compared to their current measurement that we know yet. So this gives us a tremendous advantage there. Now this is, this is the, till now we are talking about the conventional accelerator. That is what we are using, but probably days are coming when we cannot go further and further using the same technique. And our field is always evolving. And we have, in the past also, if you see the, the way we have evolved, we have always developed the new technique. So one of the most promising area of this one is this, uh, you know, uh, this Wakefield acceleration technique, where the technique is that uh, you, you have a, you create, so in, in space of RF cavities, you don't have a RF cavities here anymore. So you create your radio frequency field by a pilot beam through running it through a plasma, and this creates electromagnetic field, and then there is a beam that you want to accelerate, it just follows, it's just sitting on the field created uh, by this pilot beam, and then get accelerated. Advantage of there, yes, it is possible to accelerate to one GeV per meter, it's a much improvement compared to the conventional accelerator we are talking here. However, the main problem is not the accelerating to higher energies, but it is to keep the beam you know, in a concentrated way and squeezed way. And that's the main problem they are facing and they are trying to solve that problem, how they will keep the intensity uh, for that beam. Because for us, it is not only energy, we also need the intensity uh, to be followed. Okay, so now coming back from the energy frontiers to intensity frontiers, and this is the power of loops, the power of quantum loops here, and it is possible. And if you look into the past, it is possible to do low energy physics and predict something at the very high energy, in just without going to the high energy in the normal front energy frontier accelerator. And that has happened in the past, many such examples, even, you know, muon lifetime, you can predict the mass of the W boson, the neutral current gave us the Z boson, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CP violation in the 60s told us there had to be a third uh, generation before the top and bottom quark was observed, and so on. So there are many examples and these are the power of the power of the loop. This is where the intensity frontier plays a major role, or this is also known as the precision frontier. And there are some, you know, players is going to be there in soon. The main player that is coming up and next year probably is the super KKB factory that we all know about the success of the B factory, the Babur and Bell in, uh, in the precision physics. And this is going to be the machine which, he, where, which will be 40 times higher in luminosity uh, then their earlier machine, and that is going to operate. And this is the time scale they are going to operate. They will be getting something like, uh, they will be actually starting operating next year, and is supposed to get to their full luminosity and all the, all the luminosity physics that they want to get by 2025. So this is the time, and uh, this machine will be working. And of course, in that same time scale, the LHCB will be also running for doing the flavor physics, and uh, roughly there is two, to point where at the moment they are also planning their phase one upgrade 
but it is a tremendous achievement because they are going to get rid of their all hardware trigger and take all the data, whatever is happening, to the backend and then do a software trigger. That is, all the data is available to them and software trigger. So their data collection will improve it tremendously and that will help. And then there is also a plan before the high luminosity uh, LSC. There is a second phase of the proposed LSC upgrade is also there. So these two together will probably going to rule the flavor physics and in, 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 the, in the years to come. And there are many, many areas where they are going to get contribution, both from the mostly this is dominated by Bell 2, that is the super KKB factory, or the LHCB, depending upon which particular, you know, whether it is, you know, CP violation or the rare decays or CKM matrix determination, they are going to play the major role. Well, there is not, there are other, other precision experiments are coming up. You all know about the G minus two, the anomalous um, event that we or measurement that we have in BNL and uh, way back in 2003, and there is a three sigma discrepancy from the standard model data, and this same storage ring that is used in the BNL has now moved to Fermilab, and they set up there with a much higher intensity of muon beam, where they want to study this with a much much higher precision in this one, and this is also being you know complemented by the G minus two or EDM measurement at the J part where they will be using different technology. This is basically a higher energetic beam and here they will be you know, cooling the muon to a much lower energy and putting to a smaller storage ring and study this process very accurately. Of course, there is the charge <coughs> lepton flavor violation. This is another way to look for new physics to such a quantum loops. And in this case, they are looking for the mu2 E decay. And there are two players that is going to come here. One is the Mu2E at FNL, and uh, this is getting ready and uh, will be soon operational. Uh, this machine, basically, this is going to the muon will be coming and stopped here, and then it may decay into electron. In that case, you will get the specific energy, fixed energy of the electron. That's what you will see. And, uh, and then there is the comet experiment again at JPART. Uh, they are going to do the same thing in two phases, and the phase one is here, and then up to this, so that the muons will be. Will be, will be transferred through this, uh, through this magnetic field and, uh, and then ultimately there will be target will be put here and later they will put the target here. And they are, there is no standard model number here, okay, because this is not possible in standard model. So current limit is roughly 10 to the minus 12 and then in this phase approach roughly they are going to reach four orders of magnitude, I mean the precision uh, better than what we have today in this, uh, in this area. Rare K on decay, we have heard in that, um, that John Ellis talks also. There are two such programs. One is the Koto experiment at JPARC. JPARC is actually becoming a very precision you know, physics uh, place uh, for this kind of physics in the hadron physics. And they are looking for this uh, particular decay, uh, uh, K0 long going to pi 0 nu nu bar, and uh, looking for in addition to the standard model, is there any additional contribution of non standard model? And uh, so this is where they will be reaching. The standard model prediction is there. In step one, they are already go below that, and step two, two orders of magnitude better than that. So they will clear, and they are not the again only one. And just other day, you have heard from John Ellis that that is this NA62, which is doing the same thing, but in the charge kion decay. And uh, this has already uh, they have presented their first result uh, uh, at, uh, with the five percent of the data, but no signal at Prague uh, last week. Well. So this is about the other things. Now let me come back to the neutrino physics. Neutrinos are very, very important because it is the you know, second most abundant particle in the universe, right? And uh, it can even, you know, it, it, is, it has mass. Uh, it, can, it can probe a uh, very high scale uh, through this CISO mechanism that we have heard. It is favored by, you know, many poets uh, basically like neutrinos. The Nobel Co Committee is also like neutrinos. There are eight physicists got Nobel Prize for neutrinos. And most importantly, I love neutrinos. So I must talk about them. So there are neutrinos we know uh, that uh, what is remaining for in the neutrino physics to do? A lot, actually. I would say that precision era of neutrino physics has just started. We have to answer many questions. What is the dominant flavor content of nu3? We don't know. That basically means what is the octant of the theta23? whether it is 45 degree less than 45 degree or more. The mass of the neutrino, the absolute mass, we don't know. We know that it is less than two electron volt right now. 
but uh, we have to measure to a much higher accuracy. The neutrino mass ordering, we have seen the three masses of neutrino masses. We don't know which one is the heaviest, which one is the lightest. So we have to answer that question. Then this is the CP violation in the, uh, in the neutrino physics, whether this will be very important because this through the leptogenesis and, uh, and may, may generate and may explain the matter antimatter asymmetries of our universe, as you have heard in the earlier talk. And whether the mere um, uh, neutrino is a Dirac or a Majorana particle, but uh, you know, this, if we can establish that, that is a lepton flavor violation, the lepton number violation, sorry, delta L equal to two. And this will be as important to me, as you will say, as the CP violations and um, in the priority violation that was seen in the mid 50s. Well, with all this potential, who are the players that is going to be in this field? There are quite a few. Right now, the NOVA experiment is running at, uh, with the off-axis beam, sending neutrino beam from the Fermilab to the, uh, the Ash River uh, uh, located uh, at the US-Canada border. It's uh, 500, 810 kilometers to the, uh, this thing. Then there is the T2K, ex T2K experiment, which is sending neutrino beam from j -Park to the Kamiokande, Super Kamiokande at the j -Park, uh, um, uh, from j -Park to Super Kamiokande, which is located 290 kilometers away. What are they doing? They are looking in the, in the mostly in the CP violation, it's looking for that. And, uh, and of course, there are other measurements. Now, currently look at the T2K and uh, their measurement. Okay, look at the first, the theta 2, 3. The actually, um, Amol has already pointed that out just to say that what this NOVA is measured that their theta 2, 3 is consistent with 45 degree. But however, this blue, to region is what this experiment is telling us. They are telling us that theta 2, 3 is non-zero. So there is basically a complete tension between these two experiments. We have to resolve that. And, but one good thing is happening. They are narrowing down the range of CP violation. Already at two sigma level, we have indication that CP phase is not zero. Okay, this is, this is very important. So we have already indication that CP is violated in the neutrino sector, but then, they, what they want to do, now T2K, because they have seen that the CP violation, probably they are going to be first to establish CP violation. They want to run their experiment for the next so many years. And I think this is up to 25 or 27 or so. Uh, uh, they want to run this experiment. And at the end of this run, they will be able to establish CP violation to more than three sigma level, okay? If the current CP value that they are measuring or that are indicated is correct. So this is a good thing to happen, but they are not the only one. So in that case, so, and then what will happen there? So let's look at that one. So this is what you are seeing here is how the accelerator is increasing the number of protons, because that is most important. How many protons you are getting converted into neutrinos? How many neutrinos you are detecting? And by that time, this rich here, this is almost 1.3 megawatt equivalent, okay? So this 1.3 megawatt is their final target so over the next 10 hours, they will reach there in their accelerator and T2, um, T2K experiment will be running. And then at that time, they will replace this super Kamiokande detector by plan is that much bigger hyper Kamiokande detector. And this will be already the beam power is 1.3 megawatt. And then they will continue running uh, this uh, hyper Kamiokande and, uh, and the beam. And this is their coding seamless is a productive program from T2K to or T2HK. They will move and uh, they will get there. About other than uh, this uh, Japan, there is a program, similar program at the Fermilab. They want to send uh, beam from Fermilab to Homestead, which is 1,300 1, uh, kilometers away, long baseline neutrino experiment. So they are producing the beams here and then sending to the art, uh, to the, to the Homestead mine at uh, 1.6 kilometer underground, they will have the detector. This detector will be the most precision detector ever built. 60 kiloton of liquid argon technology, okay? We have built only 300 tons so far. 60 kiloton of liquid argon technology that will be in, divided into the four cryostat. Each of them, actually it is more than 60 kiloton. 60 kiloton is the fiducial volume. Each of them will have 17 kiloton of liquid argon. You know, this is a humongous detector. Each of them is some like, like 60 meter in length and 14 meters in height and another 14 meters in uh, depth. So this four of them together, the purpose is there is to look for CP violation and neutrino mass hierarchy. 
This is the broadband beam. The broadband beam, unlike the other two, T2K and NOVA, is a narrow beam. They send a very narrow neutrino beam. But here, the beam energy is spread over a wide band. So this is called broadband beam. Advantage here, in the same beam, they will be able to see the first oscillation maxima and the second oscillation maxima, OK, both them. And the advantage there, in the second oscillation maxima, these three color is for three values of the CP phase. You see this, the difference get pronounced in the second maxima than in the first maxima, OK? So they want to send that beam and then looking for the CP violation. So this will be the best place to the CP violation experiment. For example, this is their CP sensitivity. If you can see, they will have a five sigma sensitivity for most of the region, both normal and inverted. And if I compare that for hyper K, of course, hyper K will have much little higher, something like eight sigma significant they will reach in that type. So they are basically uh, the, uh, will run the CP phase or determination of the CP. And nobody else will be doing that. Of course, they will also do mass hierarchy. 1,300 kilometer is a quite lot uh, you know, distant to move the neutrino through the earth. And then they will have at least five sigma significant for the mass hierarchy determination using these detectors. And we have had other programs. Somebody was asking me, so I put these transparencies. They will also do what you call the short baseline experiment, especially to address uh, the question of this uh, fourth generation of neutrinos and uh, the LSND result. So for that, they have a set of three detectors, actually. This is, the, this is their hair, is the beam is produced, and this is the near detector, short baseline neutrino detector. Then there is the micro boom already running, and this is the Icarus detector right now is being transported from, from CERN to Fermilab. This, is, this detector will be operation. And these three detectors will be uh, there uh, to really uh, to explore that, uh, that, uh, that physics. So Fermilab has a very rich program for neutrino physics, both in short baseline and in long baseline there. Well, they are not the only one. And uh, if our activists allow us, if our politicians allow us, we'll build the INO. And uh, INO is supposed to be built under a tunnel and uh, it is also going to completely different way. It is going to use the atmospheric neutrinos to address the neutrino mass hierarchy. It is a 50 kiloton magnetized iron detector. This is this size of magnetized iron detector has the advantage that you can simultaneously, on even by even basis, you can separate out with the neutrinos and anti-neutrinos, and that will help you to resolve the mass hierarchy to a level of three sigma uh, uh, in, in, within, within something like seven years or so. Okay. So this is what uh, uh, INO wants to do in the future. And then, but uh, mass hierarchy, there are other players coming up. The Juno experiment in China, they want to use a liquid scintillator detector of 20 kiloton size. Okay, 20 kiloton liquid scintillator with unprecedented resolution. Never achieved in liquid scintillator of this kind of resolution of 3% by square root of E. But they are doing now their R&D to reach that goal of 3% by square root of E. If they achieve that, and they're also already on the construction uh, process, they're starting, then they will be using completely complementary method, whereas we are using <coughs> the earth matter effect in, uh, in INO. They will be using the reactor neutrinos, and the reactor neutrinos is basically solar neutrino deep here, and on top of that is the wiggle that you see, the modulation that you see is basically because of the atmospheric oscillation, and this will have different phase based upon the red and blue, you have to separate out. These are basically for normal hierarchy and inverted hierarchy. So looking at whether at that they'll be sitting at this peak and looking at whether the blue or the red one is correct. So that's why they need extremely good energy resolution for their experiment. And if they can succeed, they are supposed to be, you know, of the level of five sigma level, they will be achieving uh, the, the mass hierarchy issue uh, in, 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 in 10 years time. That, that they, they will be probably starting in uh, 2019 if everything goes well, and they will run this experiment. Well, this is not all thing is happening. I have just to show you one transparency on the double beta decay, because that's why the myelin nature of the neutrinos will be determined. And then, uh, so this is, uh, this is actually the Kamlan uh, um, experiment, and where uh, they are using uh, the, uh, this experiment is slowly, uh, going up to, so what do we do in double, uh, neutronless double beta decay experiment? You basically measure the lifetime, okay? That's what, your, 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 your decay experiment is just measure the lifetime. And from the lifetime, 
you can find out this is the, this is the connection between the lifetime and the neutrino mass, okay? Metallic and neutrino mass. So this is, but this is, this process of converting the lifetime to the neutrino mass is not that simple because this is a, this is a big question here. This is the neutrino, uh, nuclear matrix element, which has many, you know, error and so on. So our colleagues, theory colleagues are trying to reduce their error on this one. And, and with that, and we can improve uh, the, the lifetime measurement, then we can go to, with the, with the next stage of Kamland experiment, we will be able to go show something like the 20 milli electron volt level. We will be measuring the neutrino masses if they are Majorana particle, okay? If they are Majorana particle, up to 20 milli electron volt. And that, and that is actually very important because this blue card is what is the inverted hierarchy gives you. Okay, if it is neutrinos are in, in, inverted hierarchy, then you have to find the mass at that level. Okay, so then at least if if Majorana particle and if it is in, uh, inverted hierarchy, the Kamlan will be probably completely either see or rule that out from that experiment. And there are actually there are other experiment also. Uh, this is this is also Xenon, and there is this uh, NEXO. That is the next EXO experiment, which is this is around thousand kg of uh, of, of, uh, of xenon, and this is 5,000 kg, five times bigger, with 90% enriched, because this is the xenon 136, which is the candidate for double beta decay. So you have to have 90% enriched, and uh, they will be able to reach something like three to eight milli electron volt with, with this detector in near future. So that is probably the end of uh, this kind of experiment, but I think quite ambitious, and we hope to see some exciting result from there. Now let me just, uh, last few minutes that I have, let me just, just talk about a little bit of uh, cosmic frontiers. I will not be able to do much there because there is a huge field. It's, I'm not going to talk about anything about dark energy and so on. Even in the dark matter, I will be just, because so much discussion has taken place and since my time is limited, let me just talk a little bit about what is going to happen in the direct search. That's all, who are the major players there? I think that will do the suffice. And so let me just, this one, so we are roughly here, okay? We are roughly here now. Actually, already the xenon one ton is already given result. So who are the little player? Is uh, is the main player here? Is uh, let me just move this. From um, I think I will just because this you have already discussed here. So this has already xenon one ton is already given us recent result. A couple of months back, you have seen that. And uh, the main player will be uh, is uh, is LZ, which is the combination of these two collaboration group, Lux and Zeppelin, and what they're going to build is a, is a 10 ton total detector, okay? And uh, this is all uh, liquid xenon, and uh, with seven ton active, and uh, this is the xenon N ton has a plan uh, starting for 2018 uh, to have a eight ton total and six ton active. So there are comparison level, okay, comparable level. So they are coming soon uh, to address the dark matter search, but the final frontier probably will be the Darwin. It is actually planned similar xenon, liquid xenon technology, but aims uh, sensitivity of a few uh, into 10 to the minus 14 centimeter level. So this is limited by irreducible neutrino background. I'll come to that in the next transparency. R&D started 50 ton total compared to the earlier eight tons and so on. And 40 tons is fiducial for the TPC. And uh, uh, sorry, 30 tons is for the fiducial. 40 tons will be inside the TPC. Rest is outside, so total uh, this, uh, volume uh, they are going to build. And what they will reach with that, the Darwin is here, okay? And you already have, we are slowly then reaching this neutrino flow. Basically, the neutrino interaction will, this is, this is this low energy, you have the solar neutrinos, and higher energy, you have the atmospheric and other neutrinos. So this will be reaching, so we'll be completely cleaning up. And I have not much time to talk about, this is only high mass um, region, but you have to address here, there is the empty space, I mean, it may be possible here. The, the super CDMS snow lab using the silicon-based detectors, they have both germanium silicon, but the silicon detector will help them to actually to, to cover this, uh, this gap in the low mass uh, dark matter. So this will complete probably that picture there. Well, so this is, the, this is the really the field that I wanted to cover, and I have given you the glimpse of uh, what is happening the roadmaps of the experimentalists that uh, they have. Now, so let me just uh, conclude. So our journey continues. So we are about to start our exploration of the dark side of our universe. 
and miles to go before I sleep. Quote, and you also. So we have to cover a long distance. No road map to guide us. We have completed standard model. You are not giving us any road map. We have to follow only our road map. And that's in terms of milestones and, you know, project reports and so on. Nothing to do with science. But we'll have many candles to guide us in this darkness that I pointed out all those candles. Thank you. Is it that you look for that with um, um, decays with neutrinos also allowed? You presented it as a half-life, but is it dominated by decays with neutrinos? No, no, no. You look, this no. is neutrino less. So all the decays are going to be only neutrino less. So that no. you have the energy in the energy beam that you are looking for your signal. But then there are other uh, outside that there are. There are background. So that will be background. Neutrinos. So you have neutrinos. to you have to take care of the background. With and the half life some of our controversies are basically because of the background you have you know that one and there was some you know group claimed already that, that they have seen it but it turns out yeah but the half life is going to be dominated by those the background no 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 no, no. certainly the, the half what the, the, they will be going to reach 10 to the power 26 and that's basically background after taking care of the background